for showing up. Tina, great to see you again. I know you're in for a wonderful presentation. Eric, Mr. Eric Pittman in front of you, is located in Victoria. He is one of the leading authorities on hummingbirds around the area. And in particular, I believe it's the Rufus hummingbird. Am I correct, Eric? That's what we're looking at today. And the Rufus hummingbird is the migratory hummingbird to BC. That's correct. Okay, well, with that in mind, uh, Eric, I'm going to leave it to you. You can start your video whenever you would like, and we'll move along. And like we say, Tina, if you have any questions, or Serena, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them in. Eric may or may not see them. If he doesn't, I will chime in as well. But we're going to let Eric take it over and come to you with some incredible information that he's got. Take it away, Eric. Okay, well, thank you very much, Randy. Um, Hi Tina and Serena. Today we're going to be talking about Miss Rufus and Rusty. And Miss Rufus, as you may have guessed, is a Rufus hummingbird. And they're the migratory hummingbird that comes from Mexico to British Columbia in the springtime. They usually arrive here around the end of February or mid-March. And you can see what kind of forest they are in here. I've, I've filmed about a hundred hummingbird nests from egg to flight and this is one of the rare rufous hummingbirds that I've been able to film and rufous hummingbirds are very have a lot of sight fidelity there goes Miss Rufus out of her nest right there so this shows you the kind of forest that they're in and what her nest looks like when you look at it from the side it basically looks like a lump on on a branch and here's what it looked like from the ground and you couldn't get a very good shot of it from the ground, but you could see that it was right near the edge of a roof. And these people were very uh, happy to have me film from the roof, so I was able to do that this summer. And here we are on the roof, and as I pan back, you're going to see my other equipment on the roof, which allowed me to webcast the nest, so we were able to have a live nest cam on this uh, hummingbird. So here we are, March 28th, and she has an egg in the nest. So if you take a look at the nest, uh, you'll see that it's made out of all kinds of fibers that she finds in the forest. And she still likes to feather her nest whenever she can. So she will go out and pick up feathers or little fibers just to insulate things and keep it warm. The problem with all the light fibers and hummingbird beaks is that hummingbird beaks often have a little bit of sticky nectar on them which stick to feathers. But once she gets it off there, she'll tuck it in and form it into the nest with her little feet. Now, the, the fibers that she's using at this point are things from uh, trees that she's picked off, moss and lichen, little pieces of fur, uh, twigs and that kind of stuff. And then it's all wrapped up with a spider web so it sticks together and it provides some sort of elastic um, containment so that it can stretch and move with the chicks. So she's got two chicks in there now. And I'll just pan back once more with the camera so that you can see how small and vulnerable they are uh, when you're looking at a forest. It's very difficult to find these nests. And I was lucky that uh, the people that owned the property had spotted it the year before. She's actually reusing a nest that she had used the, the year before. So she's able to uh, lay the egg, re re renovate it basically and lay the eggs. And when you see weather being inclement around here. Remember that hummingbirds have to protect their nests at all times. Here she is in a hailstorm. And of course it was early March so it's still pretty cold. So we decided to help her out and what we did is we put out some humming helper. And that's a type of nest material that she uses to insulate a bit more. And you can see that the nest is substantially higher now, two days after that hailstorm after she's got her hands on that humming helper and you can see the white material on the front part of the nest that is what it is there and as the nest uh, ages with her she's going to start covering that up with lichen and things so it doesn't shine so white but it did provide her with some extra insulation and made the nest quite a bit higher april 15th and we've got a hatch so you can see rusty to the left of the other egg and the other egg has the half shell of rusty's egg on top but kind of like a football helmet and it's unfortunate but the other egg did not uh, hatch and it may have been killed by the coldness of the hail when things came around but anyway rusty was able to make it and you can see rusty moving around here now you can see the 
part of Rusty's eggshell on the left there, and that's going to get picked out by Mom. And the egg, uh, she can't move the egg out, but the egg will get buried in the bottom of the nest and covered over with more fluff as she continues to bring that to, to the nest. Now this is a really special moment. This is Rusty's first feeding by Miss Rufus. And you can see that she gently puts the beak into the little bird's crop and she opens it up and she gives him some fluid and that helps to open up the crop and make the digestive system start up and then she jumps on top of little Rusty to keep him warm. Hummingbirds cannot regulate their body temperature until they get to be almost 10 days or 2 weeks old so at this time they're completely dependent on their mother and Miss Rufus will sit on top of them for about 90% of the time. Now four days after he hatched Little Rusty is getting quite a bit bigger. You can see the eyes on the side. They haven't opened yet. But he does have some fuzz on the back of his, uh, on his back. And those are little feathers that act as sensors. Those sensors pick up the wind that the mother generates when she lands at the nest. And it sort of tickles his back. So Rusty then instinctively sticks his head up and opens his beak for some food. And mother instinctively gives him food. Instinct plays a huge part in a hummingbird's life because obviously there's no instruction manuals and they have a big job to do. So a few days later, this is April 25th now, this is 10 days after he's hatched, and the eyes are open. So Miss Rufus feeds rusty little bugs and things that she can pick off of. Maybe uh, maybe she'll find spiders or beetles. Mostly flies, though. She, she, hummingbirds are excellent hunters when it comes to picking flies out of the air. And little Rusty is getting full benefit of this being an only chick. He's getting the... Uh, so he gets all the protein that would have been split between two chicks. So Rusty actually has a... a accelerated growth and he's only 20 days in the nest by the, by the time he flies away. Now the, the male hummingbird actually does nothing. He has about a one minute encounter with the female when they first fertilize the eggs but they never get together. He doesn't participate in nest building or in the raising of the chick or feeding of the chick or anything. He's just out to make sure that uh, he's going to help propagate the species in its small way. So let's take a little closer look at the back of this little 10-day-old hummingbird. You see those those pin feathers there? That's a keratinous covering out over the feather which has to be broken off to release the fibers that form the soft part of the feather. And here we are, we're 19 days now. This chick has been in the, in the nest uh, hatched for 19 days and Miss Rufus has been feeding it about every half hour, all the daylight hours. So when, if you ever watch a hummingbird nest, if you sit there for half an hour, you're going to see the mom come and feed the chick. That's, that's their schedule. And that continues right up until the day they, they fledge. And so does working on the nest. You can see Miss Rufus isn't happy with the placement of this feather, so she's going to poke it around a bit. And sometimes she needs a little bit of leverage to get it, so she might just climb on top of her chick to get the best leverage possible. Now, you might wonder if that hurts the chick. Well, the birds only weigh about 4 grams, so that's very light. So they have virtually no weight at all. So it doesn't hurt the chick at all. Now, as the chick gets ready to fly, they do what's called winger sizing. So they get out there on the edge of the nest and they flap their wings and try to build up their muscles. And it'll, they'll winger size for about an hour to two hours every day after they're about, uh, in this case, it started when he was about 16 days old. And then he'd start flapping around and they also start to explore a bit. So not no longer content to just uh, wait for mom feeding, little Rusty starts looking around for food. So he'll start to pick up little bugs or or maybe little bits of plant material, or a little bit of nectar if he can find it, that he can reach from the nest. Still reluctant to leave the nest though. And here comes mom right on cue to give him another feeding. And you can see that they're they're quite flexible and they can he can bend his head way back to get the food and mom's giving him 
uh, little flies and little bugs. And you're going to see a little fly stuck to the edge of the beak here on Mom in just a second as she tries to give it to Rusty, but it doesn't quite work. So now she has a little fly stuck to the side of her beak. There it is. And she's trying to give it to him, but he can't, just can't quite get him. It's very hard to tell if it is a, bi a boy or a girl. Uh, the way... It, uh, when the Rufus Hummingbird gets older, the feather patterns and colors will change, but as a uh, as a, a juvenile like this, there really is no way, no easy way to tell if it's a, a chick or if it's a boy or a girl. So little Rusty now doing a bit more winger sizing. Something about little chicks, uh, hummingbird chicks, is that they can't fly until they can let go of the nest. So they tend to uh, fly up or to the side, but a hummingbird's claws are naturally closed. So if you ever come across a hummingbird that's sitting on a branch and it goes to sleep, its, its little feet are going to close, so, and, and when they're old enough, then they can let go and fly away like that. So that's his first flight, and now little, Ruf, little Rusty has taken his first steps towards migrating to Mexico. Well, how far does he go? Well, he doesn't go very far. Luckily, I was close by so I could get in and, and do some filming. And little Rusty flew about eight feet into another section of the hemlock tree. So I can see him now. I suppose you probably can't, but I, I have the advantage of knowing where he is. But little Rusty settled down into a little branch on the hemlock tree. And when chicks first fledge and they get to a branch, they may sit on that branch for an hour or a day. They are not anxious to go flying around. They're, they have to absorb a, a, a bit of where they are. They have to get a look at the world. And like I say, there's no manual that comes with being a bird, but they do have an awful lot of instinct that works in their favor. So when he's sitting on the branch, he'll peep to attract his mom, because of course mom goes to the nest and sees he's not there. And now she'll start following him around the forest and again feeding him about every half hour. So she'll find him no matter where he is, uh, just by the peeping. And it's uh, it's an incredible thing to see a mother hummingbird find her little chick, because as you can see, that little chick is not easy to find, and is very small in that forest. It's one of those things that people don't think about when they go cut down a tree or clear some land, but there's a whole ecosystem in there that you don't even see or recognize. Now here's a surprising discovery that we made with Miss Rufus, and that is that she had another nest as well. She started this nest about two days before Rusty fledged, and it's about 30 feet away from the first one. So she would go from one nest to the other. Now this nest doesn't have eggs in it yet, but on May 21st they did hatch. So this is the first time we've been able to document a Rufus hummingbird having two nests. So it was a very exciting discovery, and it does beg the question, how many nests do they have? Because when a Rufus hummingbird leaves in September to go down to Mexico, they've got to be ready and able to, to do that flight. So does a two-month-old hummingbird chick have enough energy to make it to Mexico? Can it, do they have enough skills? Well, it would seem so. And here you can see Miss Rufus climbing on top of this little chick now. And Rusty is out in the forest. By this time, uh, Rusty will be feeding himself and, and will be an independent little bird. And his little uh, hardwired instincts will be guiding him, guiding him through life. Now, you may remember that I spoke a bit about sight fidelity, about how the hummingbird uh, came, came back to her nest the, from the year before. Well, that is a another part of what's uh, being studied about rufous hummingbirds right now. In this area, rufous hummingbirds used to be the predominant hummingbird, but they are dying out, or at least becoming less. And part of that may be due to their sight fidelity, because as they go from Mexico to British Columbia, they may be stopping in the same valleys on the same days, or following the same river, or the same path, but if somebody's built a shopping center there or a city has sprung up, those areas may be destroyed and it may make it hard for them to get the nutrients or the location that they want to 
uh, stay in for any particular time and it may throw off their migration pattern. Now when they're a fully formed hummingbird, and this is Miss Rufus in the garden now, uh, they do enjoy a good sprinkle, so they do come around and uh, if you have the sprinklers out, they're quite likely to go out and get a little bath or a shower in it, and they quite enjoy that. Now they usually do have two nests per egg, but they, in uh, Miss Rufus's first nest, they only the one hatched, and that may have been due to the time of year. Maybe a piece of hail got in and made one egg a little bit less viable, or it may just not have been fertilized. It's, it's really hard to know. But in most cases, they'll have two eggs. And this is just a fun little shot of Miss Rufus having a, having a shower. And they are very, uh, they really enjoy water. She sat there for about half an hour having a nest, and I was about 10 feet away. Or she, she sat there for about half an hour having a shower. I was about 10 feet away filming her, and she showed no fear at all. Of course, by this time, she's fairly used to me, having seen me for a month or two. And she just uh, is quite happy to take a shower and let me film her, and she just cools down. So I hope you enjoyed uh, watching these hummingbirds. This is something that's a big passion of mine. Like I say, I've filmed about a hundred nests from egg to flight, and I always see something different with each one. And with seeing that many, you start to recognize a lot of different patterns. Uh, just the different ways the birds interact. And it's always interesting and exciting to see. Here's something I never get tired of. She's just enjoying having a light, nice water drop on her forehead to cool her down on a hot afternoon. And it's just a, a delightful thing to see. So they really are the little jewels of the forest. So when you're out there taking care of the environment, Take care of the little things, because if you take care of the small things, the big things will be okay, too. I hope you enjoyed that. So, uh, Eric, I see, a, I see yes. a couple of questions here, Eric. Uh, mm -hmm. Tina has asked, uh, is it usually one egg per nest, two, three, five? How many eggs per nest? And are there any predators I'm seeing for baby Rusty if he's out sitting on a branch for so long? Right. Well, uh, it's usually two eggs, and usually two hatch, but if the weather is bad or something, then you might just have one hatch. Um, as far as predators going, they are way safer sitting on a branch than sitting in the nest. In fact, it's a uh, it's kind of a race to get them out of the nest. Because when the hummingbirds start to peep, they don't usually peep when they're in the nest. But if they do, it can attract predators like crows or other birds. So they, they are in danger from other birds, and that is probably their biggest uh, predator. It would be crows or uh, bewicks, wrens actually also will tear them out of the nest, uh, which may not be a factor of trying to eat them, but bewicks, wrens are very territorial in their nesting behavior and may just want to destroy the hummingbird nests. But when they're on a branch, then they're able to fly away if they need to. So the safest place a little baby hummingbird can be is out of the nest. So another question, are cats uh, a problem as well, Eric, at all? Absolutely. Cats and dogs both uh, tend to be attracted to any hummingbird that's uh, low enough for them to get. Luckily, they're very fast, so it's very rare that a cat or a dog will be able to catch them. But it does happen occasionally. Uh, other things that happen... You know, they might run into a window. I've seen that happen. Um, and they're very fragile little birds, so uh, there are a lot of things that can impact their, you know, their life cycle. Uh, they, on average, they seem to live about two to three, maybe four years. There have been documented cases of 11 and 12-year-old birds, uh, but they're very hard to... Uh, obviously, you have to have it tagged and... Um, you know, that way you know which bird it is. Um, to keep the wasps away, that's always a hard thing to do. The best thing... ...you can do is... ...and it kind of looks like a flying saucer with the top that completely comes off. And what it does is, is it means that whatever is eating from that 
feeder has to have a beak that will be an inch long or more to get into it. So that tends to keep the wasps away because they don't they can't get in to get the, the feeder the ne the nectar. But so, it is difficult to keep wasps away from, from hummingbird feeders. Another question, Eric, how do you differentiate between a male and a female hummingbird? When they're older, uh, the male tends to have a uh, darker head. What we've been looking at in this video is all females. The, the male, when it catches the light properly, will shine bright, bright red. Almost, uh, it, well, it is an iridescent red. Um, and it'll be basically from his shoulders and over the top of his head uh, and, his, and uh, underneath his chin. So they'll have a completely red head. The females look like what you're seeing now, uh, basically a little bit of red on the on the gorget, but mostly it's it, it's not very shiny. The males tend to be the shinier birds. When you see hummingbirds diving, uh, they they're they they're not really feuding families, but they are individuals, and individuals will protect a feeder or a territory. And I, I'm not sure why they're so territorial, but they can be quite vicious. They often will uh, actually have fights, which can lead to the death of another bird. I saw one hummingbird knock another hummingbird out with this kind of activity. Uh, and I thought the little hummingbird was dead, but it, it revived and flew away. But it's surprising the amount of uh, territorial behavior that you see among humming, hummingbirds. Thinking that we think they don't need to eat a lot of material, but to them it's all consuming and they, they spend their entire day trying to find food. So any little bit counts. So when they're building a nest, Eric, is there any particular tree they prefer or location they prefer over others? You know, people ask me that all the time because I've seen so many nests, but the reality is that it just seems to be random. There are certain birds that will develop certain uh, preferences for different kinds of trees. For instance, the ones in my backyard tend to like the pear tree, which is a kind of a snaggled old uh, mature pear tree with lots of places for them to nest and surprisingly the majority of nests in that pear tree have been on the same branch so there seems to be something about that branch and that configuration that at least five birds have liked at more than the other plants in my yard but as i go through the forest i see hummingbird nests on what's called ocean spray which is a a bush which grows about 15 feet high at, at the best. Uh, I've seen them in arbutus trees, I've seen them in fir trees, I've seen them on electrical wires. So th there doesn't seem to be a set pattern and it's almost a random uh, choice that they make. Uh, and again, often close to buildings or to uh, human activity, which tends to scare away other birds like crows or maybe bigger predators. So they, they actually find some, I think they have a less mortality when they nest closer to humans, as long as there are still enough plants and, and suitable trees for them to live and eat with. Do they always nest in trees? Could they build a nest uh, like the swallows do, attached to a house or something, or a bridge? Yes, I, I've seen them on, uh, uh, I saw one on a hook, on a metal hook that hung down from a, from a balcony. It just, uh, it was about a, well, one of those hooks that you might screw in to hang a uh, picture off of, a large one of those, somebody had hung a planter from it, but it nested right in the hook of the, of the metal hook. Yeah, it's very, uh, they often do that. And you can probably online find pictures of them on chandeliers or electrical wires with their nest. And it's, again, it's an amazing feat uh, to realize that a bird can make a nest that lasts long enough to get the chicks hatched and out of there. And it can be just on a single piece of wire. It is, it's an amazing uh, instinct that allows them to use the materials that they can pick to build this nest. Um, when they're, the chicks are usually about uh, 
35 days old when they're completely independent from mom. So the, with the case of uh, Rusty, he was in the nest for 20 days. He was hatched on April 15th and uh, fledged on May 5th. So that's 20 days. And then she fed him for about two weeks after that. And it, it, she will wean him off. So the you know for the first few days it'll be every hour every half hour and then after a few days it'll be every hour and then after that it'll sort of wean off to maybe once every two hours as rusty starts to learn how to eat so it takes a, takes about two weeks after they're out of the nest before they're completely on their own well if you randy do you have any more questions well, I'm just sitting here thinking you've had some incredible information. These are some great questions we're getting from Tina and Serena as well. And I'm just trying to think if I had any, because this has been fascinating, is I have hummingbirds buzzing around me all the time out here where I live. And yeah. that's why I wondered about the trees, because i got a big evergreen and I've got a Manitoba maple in my yard. And I know there's got to be a nest somewhere. I just can't see it. Now, is that normal that their nests are well camouflaged? That's uh, one of their biggest defenses is sitting still and blending in. You'll think that a hummingbird is fearless, but they're they're really not fearless. They just don't think that you can see them. So when they make a nest in a tree, it's often that you can't see it unless you see the hummingbird go to it. So what I suggest, Randy, is that if you think that there's a nest in it, uh, just get yourself a chair and sit there and watch and wait and, you know, maybe have a soft drink or something else and... Uh, Take your time. Just sit there and listen to the bird. Mm -hmm. When the, if she does have chicks, you will start to hear her call to her chicks when she arrives with food. Uh, because as the chicks get older, if you remember I spoke about the little trigger feathers on the back, uh, when the mother comes in and the chick is quite young, the wind from her wings will trigger the, uh, it'll tickle the back of the little hummingbird and they'll raise their head to get, to get food. Well, as they get older, those little trigger feathers become less sensitive because they've got more feathers. So the mother starts using audible cues. She'll make a little chip, chip, chip as she comes in towards the nest. So you might start listening for that and then just watch and see where it goes. That's the, the key to finding a hummingbird nest is patience. Now, one more question that popped into my brain. If they only live two, three, four years, are they basically laying eggs in their second year or first you know like how old are they when they start laying their eggs well that seems to be a, a question that's not answered either uh, i would suspect that it's it's the in the case of the rufous hummingbird it would be the next year when they come back from mexico i uh, you know and it's very hard to uh you know, without keeping them in cap captivity, it's it's very difficult to find one bird that's got two nests because, you know, you have to be able to recognize the bird quite well uh, to, to make sure that it's the same bird. But we, I would suspect that a rufous hummingbird starts to uh, reproduce in its second year and will have multiple nests in the in the season. But they do have to squeeze them all in between March and September. And obviously they can't, uh, if, if it takes, uh, say, a, a month for the chick, for the egg to hatch, and then three weeks for the chick to fledge, that's almost two months. So they have to start, or at least, sorry, they have to stop reproducing at least two months before they, they're ready to migrate. So in the case of uh, the rufous in this area, that means that the last chicks have to be out of the nest by the end of June or beginning of July to get them oh. ready to fly to Mexico in September. So there's no nesting going on in Mexico? They just go down like on a holiday to suntan? Hard to say. I, I have never heard of a rufous hum nest in Mexico. And there's a, there's a uh, study going on to find out where they go uh, and... People really have, uh, there's not a lot of information about that. So we don't know if they go down and nest in the wintertime or if they just go down and, and eat bugs. Hmm. Ah, you've seen Anna's hummingbirds here, but much, much less than the Rufus. Um, 
Anna's hummingbirds are what we call resident hummingbirds in BC now. Over the last 20 years, they have come up and displaced a fair amount of rufous. It used to be that there were more rufous in this area, but with climate change and possibly with those uh, site fidelity factors I, I mentioned, where maybe a city gets built on the migration path, the rufous have been uh, declining and the annas have been exploding. Now, part of that is also probably in that the annas is, are more prolific than the rufous. I've seen an, anna, an active annas hummingbird nest in my area here in every month except August. So I've seen them laying eggs in December, in January, all the way through the winter. And surprisingly with good results, they will almost always, uh, even in the harshest of temperatures in, in Victoria, uh, they will almost always uh, mature to fledge. Which is, which is encouraging. But it does mean that one Annis hummingbird can have up to eight or ten chicks per year. I've documented one Annis that had eight chicks all, that all fledged in, in one, one summer season. So it, it, there are a lot of Annis hummingbirds around here. I'm surprising that uh, you see less